Hey guys, thank you for coming out this morning. I'm Nelson Osaki, and I would like to introduce Mark Mactag. Mark Mactag has been a developer since the sixth grade, but one sad day after writing real software for real users to pay real bills, he learned that users don't care about good code, they care about cool stuff that works. Mark became passionate about making software that does what I mean software, that adapts to humans to work the way they expect it to, not the other way around. Mark lives in Japan, where he spent previously four years managing a multi-million dollar IT services and staffing business in Tokyo. In 2010, Mark took his passion for user experience to the mobile platform, finding a long weekend to design and develop the next generation of awesome mobile user experiences. I should also mention Mark is an alum of UIUC. And uh, without further ado, take it away, Mark. I forgot to put this guy on. Hang on just a second here. Oh, yeah. Sorry about that. I think I have control. Whoa. Maybe, I, maybe that's a little much. Oh, I think I get how it works. How's that? Yes. Okay. Okay, we got it. As long as everyone can see the... Um, see the screen, I'm not really too worried about it. Okay, um, so first of all, I just want to clear up one thing. Some of you may have wondered why I put 2012. Um, a lot of the things I'm going to talk today are very here and now, and they're very quickly changing, and that's going to be part of the talk. So I think the material I'm presenting is really only relevant for maybe the next six to 12 months, which is mostly 2012, so hence that. Uh, this talk is not about how to design, develop, or market a mobile app. So if you're looking for that, um, just sit in here because I guess that talk is happening at 1.30 this afternoon. Um, this talk is more about the frameworks and the SDKs that are available to develop apps on these guys. And I thought it was very, very interesting that Nelson was reading my bio off of his smartphone. Um, I don't think I need to sell or explain who those people are. Um, probably most of you are thinking about Android and iOS when I mention smartphones. But I want to mention BlackBerry and Windows for, or in Microsoft for two reasons. Uh, BlackBerry, because they actually have a very strong hold on the corporate market, which many of you, if you're students, maybe you don't know yet, but they do. And Windows, because when Microsoft wants to get into something, they'll just throw like, so much money at it until they have some market share. So I would reckon that maybe Windows Phone will actually be relevant later. I'm not sure yet. Uh, who is Long Weekend? Who am I? Um, as Nelson mentioned, I previously worked in Tokyo uh, at an IT staffing and services firm. Uh, I managed a IT staffing and contracting business, uh, and my business partners are IT, internal IT, so developing CRMs, managing infrastructure. Uh, we're also successful entrepreneurs. We've sold businesses before in the IT space, we're doing it again. We're also really big geeks. I like to program. Um, you don't usually find salespeople that program. I'm one of them. Um, if you find more of them and you're in a position to hire them, you should. We're also, uh, to borrow from, from Mark's talk yesterday from Microsoft, we're distributed. So if anything happens in Tokyo, we can keep going because there are four people in our company and we're located in four different locations. Um, the mobile space is so new that to say I'm some sort of expert in it, I'd have to do something first. And in 2009, 2010, the only thing you could actually do was write your own app. So that's exactly what we did. Uh, these are just a couple of the apps we've developed. Um, this one on the left here is called Animal Phone. Uh, if you search the App Store for Animal Phone, it's targeted at two to five-year-old children. It's, you, you can talk to gorillas and kangaroos, and it's really cute. Uh, I said it's targeted to two to five-year-olds, but I was showing it to the Yelp guys yesterday, and they were getting a real big kick out of it, so you might want to download it. Um, as I mentioned, I live in Tokyo, so this app over here is called Japanese Flash uh, with over 75-star reviews. And I don't mean reviews. I mean people writing how awesome it is. This is the number one Japanese vocabulary study tool on the iOS app market. So uh, we've done some other apps as well. We do a lot of client work. Uh, people hire us to write apps. But you know, this is how basically I've learned about all of the app stores in the marketplace. What are we doing now? Uh, we're still developing apps. Uh, we're also taking things to the next step. Does anybody know what mint.com is? Everyone kind of know? OK. Uh, it's still very early stage, as in I haven't even started coding yet. But we're actually in negotiations to maybe start this kind of business in Japan. So uh, anything mobile is what I do. And, and one of the big things I get really excited about is uh, NFC, the near-field communication RFID chips inside of phones. So you can do so much stuff with that. But 
Anyway, that's about us. So I want to put a few assumptions out there. Um, I can be a little opinionated about some things, so I want to tell you at least where I'm coming from. I'm a businessman of a four-person company. I can't afford, literally, to be theoretical. I have to feed myself. So I will always take the practical solution, generally. Um, this is not a hobby. This is not what I do full-time. So some of the recommendations I'm making and some of the conclusions I'm drawing might not be appropriate for you if, if it's more of a hobby for you. If you're just more interested in the technology of it, as opposed to maybe running a business based on this or participating in some sort of software development group, then, you know, take it for what it's uh, worth. And the final thing uh, Nelson also introduced is that I'm really, really, really keen on good user experience. I think user experience is everything. Um, I don't think I have to sell the iPhone uh, very hard to say that, that it really changed things because the user experience for it was so good. Um, I think most people, though, when they get out into uh, a development team or any sort of environment where you're developing software for end users, you run into this problem where everything is a trade-off, everything is a compromise. There's a guy on your shoulder saying, oh, I want to make this awesome feature. I want it to just work beautifully for the user. And then you've got this other guy on your other shoulder saying, but the deadline's next week. Or worse yet, it's like an investor. Like, when is it going to be finished? So there's no perfect solution to any of this. There's no uh, right answer. You know, it shouldn't always be the user experience. It shouldn't always be uh, the business side. Uh, again, to, to pull into Apple, uh, because it's in the news quite a bit this week, uh, the I o, uh, I'm sorry, iPhone 4S came out. A lot of people were expecting a new form factor and something really brand new. Apple wasn't ready yet, or at least that's the speculation. So they just put out something with better specs. Um, that's probably something where business side people said, okay, we need to put something out but we don't have anything amazing yet. So, so there's all these negotiations and trade-offs. And I want to mention that today as well, because when I'm talking about frameworks, you're always choosing trade-offs. So I just want you to be aware of them. But user experience, and unfortunately, I did have to change this slide this week. Um, some people will say, well, if you're always championing user experience, if you're always focusing on how the app works and interaction and, and developing features to be really complex and, and good for the user, you're also you're never going to release. You just keep running it out, running it out, running it out, and it's not profitable. But to those people, I would say, I mean, Apple is a very, very profitable company that, who was led by a man who said, you know, we're going to focus on the user, not on the technology. So what I want to talk about today, uh, I think in talking about mobile, it's important to talk about how we got to mobile, uh, then go on to each of the native frameworks. Um, one of the main things I want to talk about today is the cross-platform stuff. That's part of uh, what I wrote in the abstract. Maybe you're expecting a bit of that. And finally, I think HTML5 does tie all into this. And uh, so I'm going to talk about that all together and where we're going. So first, how did we get here? And I'm really basically talking about pre-smartphone web world. Um, basically, more and more things were moving off of the desktop. So from about 2002 to maybe, well, basically when the iPhone was released, you know, we have Facebook. We have things like this. This is entirely... HTML, CSS, JavaScript application. Um, and the technologies that run this haven't really changed for about the 15 years prior to that. I mean, they've developed and they've grown. The use of Ajax actually came out. You were able to use Ajax for, uh, as a technology from 1997. It wasn't widely adopted until about 2005. So the, the platform uh, hasn't really um, changed so much. And as a result, the web received this period of intense focus where everyone is just focusing on web apps. Uh, I attended this university. I graduated in 2004. I can tell you, in 2004, the word web app, as far as I know it, I mean, if you said it to me, it would make sense, but I, I'd never heard that term. Now everybody knows what that is. This is a web app. So um, basically, the frameworks all the, that you would use in the web uh, world all kind of developed in the same sort of way because they were all solving the same sort of problems and they all had the same sort of technological uh, components behind them. So this is, I, I copied this off of Wikipedia and I trimmed it down quite a bit. This is a really good graphic if you look at the whole thing. But this is uh, different web development frameworks and technologies from 1991 until 2009. Uh, unfortunately, it hasn't been updated to 2011. But basically what you can see here from right around 2004 and 2005, everyone's like, I'm getting tired of writing my own uh, database abstraction layer for MySQL and PHP. Let's do something in the open source community and bring something together. So we've got Cake PHP, we've got Symphony, Ruby on Rails, Django, ColdFusion, uh, .NET, you know, Microsoft always got to do their own thing. So 
really, everyone was doing the same thing. Model view controller. Does everyone know what model view controller design pattern paradigm is? Yeah. Everyone was doing that. Everyone had a database abstraction layer. Everybody had a template engine. Because the end parameter was the same. You output HTML, CSS, JavaScript. And you don't worry about rendering because the browser handles the rendering for you. So you're, you, the parameters of the problem are pretty fixed and defined. And unfortunately, when you've got a whole bunch of technologists all working on the same technology, when you get to the level where you're just arguing between languages, like, well, I don't like PHP, I prefer Ruby, you end up with like dudes like this who are like, I'm so cool, I use Ruby. Um, and really, it, it, I don't know, it's just, it, to me, it's like a technology going stale, which was like perfect timing when this happened. Because when the iPhone came out, uh, when the SDK was released in late 2008, um, everything was based on a native experience and not really web at all. So we're talking about C, C++, or Apple's own Objective-C. And when this happened, uh, it, it was really, I don't know, it was tough for a lot of people, I think because they had all of this experience in this other domain for the past five years, and they had that, the, the Ruby, PHP, that entire world is so high level compared to the device, or to, to iOS, the iOS platform. But the problem is, is that you can't scale this. So if I have a slow web property, or if, if, if Facebook gets more users and wants to add more servers, they can. But I can't add more processing power to your mobile phone. So the paradigm for writing apps or, or for writing anything, any software that interacts with the user is just totally different. But unfortunately, uh, labor markets being what they are, you have a bunch of people who are very, very capable in web technologies. And the first thing they're thinking is, OK, how can I get myself on this platform? How can I, how can I start writing apps for the iPhone? It's so cool. Meanwhile, You've got all these like C++ and C developers from back in the day who have been doing this on the desktop since the 90s, and they're finally having their day in the sun. They're like, ha, ha, ha. If you go back and look at all of the early big successes on the Apple App Store, most of them are OpenGL-based games where they basically just took all the content from the desktop or from whatever format it was in before, dumped it all straight in because it was all C, and it all it was C++, and it could all just compile as is. And our Ruby hipsters were like, I want to join the party, but they couldn't yet. So they started thinking, OK, well, what can we do about this? Um, and it was like, how can we avoid writing Objective-C? We have to deal with memory management. We have to know about all these low-level things. So they started thinking about cross-platform, you know, because Android was coming out at this time, too. And people said, well, in the web, I just had to write in one place, and it worked everywhere. I didn't have to handle all of these details. So we need to think of something cross-platform because all of these individual proprietary SDKs is going against progress. So you, you hear different arguments about for cross-platform. You hear things like, I mean, we proved this already once. This is why the web took off. Nobody wanted to write software for the Mac and the PC and, you know, basically all the, the Linux variants as well. So, you know, we had all these different platforms before. And the web took over. And see, that shows that, that basically that worked. Well, I, I argue that the web became what it is because of its networking capabilities, not because of the display medium. You'll hear this one from the business side of a company. We need our app to be available on all platforms because they don't want to say to any customer, no, it doesn't work on that WebOS device. But really, uh, I would challenge those people to look at the statistics. Uh, I, I left out the slide because this isn't uh, a talk about trying to convince you about different platforms. But basically, the ones I discussed earlier have a lion's share of the market share. So unless you're Rovio developing Angry Birds, it's not worth your time to develop those smaller platforms because you're just not going to get the revenue back from it. And finally, I want to code now in a language I know. And I think this is, this is what I'm kind of complaining about, people that are just not really wanting to move on and learn a different uh, technology. And it wasn't just the developers who were all like, oh, I want to get into this iOS. I want to get into this smartphone thing. All the companies, too, saw how much money Apple was making. And they're like, we want to get into this, too. Of course, there's the Google Android marketplace. Um, BlackBerry actually had a marketplace for quite a while. Uh, it just wasn't very popular. Uh, Microsoft Amazon now has their own Android marketplace. So everybody wants to own the distribution channel for these applications so they can make more money. Let's take a look at some of the native frameworks. Um, Objective-C, iOS, Cocoa Touch, uh, there's a lot of different ways to refer to programming for an Apple device. Uh, there's a lot of restrictions. You have to have an Intel-based Mac. You have to use their software. 
Uh, their software is very, very much, their SDK is very, very much configuration over convention. I'm sorry, I said that backwards. Convention over configuration. So there's a lot of conventions, and if you don't know them, you're kind of stuck. And how that, how that happens is this. Uh, this is basically from the ground up what uh, iOS looks like. So you've got the actual device hardware, an operating system, which I believe is a BSD variant, which was originally based on Mac OS, and then they modified it again for iOS. And then you've got Apple's own foundation libraries and then any other external C libraries, so your libxml, your uh, compression libraries, SQLite, like anything like that, basically written in C, compiled in C there. And then on top of that, in Objective-C and some C code as well, they have their Cocoa Touch API. And so that's basically saying um, this is a string class, this is a hash, this is a, you know basically defining things at that level, object-oriented, so on and so forth. And then finally, UI kit. Some people might say that that's actually part of um, Cocoa Touch, but that's basically saying I want a, a button here that looks like the standard button on the iPhone. So when you write an iPhone application, you're really writing probably 10 to 15%. I mean, if, if we actually went back and found all the lines of code that, that are already pre-compiled that you're writing with, your code is probably only 15% of the binary size, maybe not even. And so this basically means that, you know, there's a lot of hidden dependencies isn't the right word to say, but there's a lot of convention in there. You have to know kind of how all that stuff works. Or if you don't, things might just strangely break. And that's why a lot of people think it's hard. But um, Android is actually not so uh, dissimilar. So I think the only real difference is that they use a Java virtual, virtual machine called Dalvik. Um, iOS just has a, like a software sandbox that yells at you if you try and access files or processes outside. Uh, the other thing Android does, it is written in Java, but yet again, uh, as you know, probably know, it's written on, it's, the phone itself is running on a Linux variant, so we can use C or C++, so you can use JNI to actually bridge outside of the virtual machine. So Android, not really much different at all. So the code that you're writing in is different, and uh, of course there's some, some bits here and there, and I'm going to talk about them that are different, but it's basically the same. And I'm just saying this from my own personal experience. Uh, this is actually backwards the way I did it. I learned iOS first, and then I started programming for Android. It's not hard, really. Uh, it's, it's not that difficult. If you can program, and you're programming for one, learning the other is an exercise. You'll have to learn the other things, but there are resources out there. Uh, just talk very briefly about BlackBerry. Uh, it's Java-based, yet another SA, uh, SDK. Uh, it doesn't have as much support out there, you know, resources on the web, so on and so forth, but it is a very mature SDK as it's been around for a very long time. So that's, that's a plus for it. And uh, does anybody here have a Mango phone? Okay. <laughs> I'm not going to spend too much time on this slide. Uh, it's .NET, basically. So you can write in anything that works with .NET for Windows Mobile. But all four of those kind of major SDKs, they all have one thing in common, which is this. Most of the work is done for you, and you've just got your application logic, some sort of data layer, and basically you arrange how you want the hierarchy of views to work, and then their SDK and their device APIs do the hard work for you, basically. And that's, that's kind of how they want it to be, too. I'll explain that in a minute, but games are a little bit different. So if we're talking about games, you need that core level of performance. You kind of need to bypass all the layers and all the abstractions. And so you end up with um, something more like this you know, OpenGL, physics library, and, and you're dealing with all this stuff at a, at a much lower level. And as I was saying earlier, that's why I think the C and C++ developers were so able to get traction on the App Store early because they were already digging in and around this stuff. So really, they, all they had to do was write a wrapper that basically made their code work on the iPhone. But what I'm trying to say is if, if, you're, if a new language is too hard for you and you've come here to, like, say, What's the one cross-platform framework I can learn that solves all my problems? My answer to you today is that there is none, and I think you're already in trouble if that's the case. Because really, if you know how to develop learning another language, in my mind, if you follow the progr uh, pragmatic programmer dogma, it's actually a good thing. It forces you to think differently. So um, one other thing about the SDKs, I'm not saying run out and learn all four of them. I'm just saying that, that maybe that's not a bad approach. But each of those companies that are sponsoring those pieces of software, they want you to develop apps. As I said, they make money. I pay Apple 30% of every $7.99 that Japanese Flash makes for me. 
So they want me to develop as many apps as I can because it's, um, you know, Apple wants to stand on the platform and say we have 600,000 apps on our platform and they want to be making money from all of them. So the documentation, the support forums, all of these things are sponsored by those companies, big companies, Google, Apple, Blackberry, Microsoft. So the support forums, the, the documentation, all of that stuff is actually quite good uh, compared to, sorry, the open source community. So in a way, if you're not as technical, or if you're working with a larger team, or so, you can find more resources on these things. So that's why I was trying to say uh, a lot of people have complained about having to write in multiple SDKs and write in multiple languages. I understand their pain, as I had to translate an iOS app to an Android app for a client a couple weeks ago. But literally, it was me copying and pasting the code from Xcode into Eclipse and basically rewriting the logic. And it was not hard. Um, also. There's another really big reason that we should appreciate the native frameworks, and that is that they are slightly different in their implementations. This was stolen from, uh, just blatantly stolen Google image search from an O'Reilly uh, online thing, where they were talking about writing like mobile websites on the Android browser, uh, which I thought was very interesting because they've got a back button there. And that back button to me looks very iOS-like, which is very funny because as I recall, every Android device, including the one in my pocket, has a back button as part of the system. Most of them are hardware buttons, although some of the new tablets have software back buttons. So you've already got a back button on the phone, right, where your thumb probably already is. But now they've put another one in there because they want to look like the iPhone. Um, and the iPhone doesn't have any hardware buttons other than the home button. So the platforms are different. And so if we try and treat them as the same with some sort of cross-platform framework, we are going to run into problems. And this is a minor difference. Um, this one will just make it feel like it was written for another platform and then somebody ported it. There are major differences, though, too, uh, getting down a little bit deeper. Android has a concept called intents, so what you intend to do so with something. I think probably the best example is if your application, you want to be able to send a tweet. Uh, it doesn't make sense for you to write a Twitter implementation, an OAuth implementation, all the stuff that you have to do to post to Twitter's API. It's silly to make everyone do that in every single app. So they'd rather have an app that says, I know how to post tweets. And then you send the Android uh, virtual machine an intent. I want to send a message, and it's a tweet. And then it goes through and says, OK, who does that? And gives the user a list. And then the user can handle which Twitter application they want to use to post the tweet. Uh, iOS has something similar. It's not as good. Uh, URL handlers. So just basically, you register a uh, protocol handler. So our app, Japanese Flash, is jflash colon slash slash. And so we've kind of written a handler in there. But um, short of using some sort of RESTful thing inside your application, the Android intents are much, much more flexible. So there, there are some pretty big differences. So now, now that I've talked about these differences in the frameworks, how are the cross-platform frameworks doing? Uh, when I was making this presentation, I want to tell you what my criteria were. I want to know what's possible. That's quite obvious. Uh, vendor lock-in is something that's really key to me. A lot of these people that are making these frameworks are companies for profit. And of course, they want to keep you using their system. Are you stuck using their system? As I mentioned, community support, it's very good for the native SDKs. How is it for these individual uh, platforms? And of course, price. Another thing which gets its own slide is unit testing. I will not get on my unit testing soapbox today. It's too early for that. But if you can't do testing for your application, that's like, I mean, I just crossed it off the list right then for me. And I will say that I was actually very disappointed in doing my research that, that unit testing for a lot of these seems to be a hack so far. So basically, this is, I, I'm going to keep going back to this slide. You've written the 15%, and now their SDK and their device APIs. So what these cross-platform frameworks are trying to do is say, you just keep writing that 15%, and we'll handle mapping what you wrote to the native SDK. And unfortunately, I think that you can end up with some, some bad behavior that way. Um, the frameworks. Appcelerator Appceler Titanium is one of the biggest ones. Uh, originally, uh, iOS. I'm going to talk about that. PhoneGap. Uh, Adobe has a product called Air. Uh, there's a product called Corona SDK, mostly focused on writing games. Same with Marmalade SDK. It used to be called AirPlay, and then Apple said, we want to make something called AirPlay. Um, 
I found MoSync when I was doing research. Like, I can find more of these if I just keep searching. It's a, as I said, it's a problem. A lot of people, particularly from the web domain, are like, well, we don't want to maintain multiple code bases. So they're trying to come up with a solution. So the, the number of frameworks at the moment is probably quite long. But again, these are the big ones that have gained some traction so far. Taking a look at Titanium, you write in JavaScript. So everything is very declarative in JavaScript. Now, it is written in JavaScript, so you can make some hacks and make uh, unit testing work. And then when you export your app, it actually builds it down, and they reinterpret your JavaScript to find out what you meant to do in the native platform and build you a native app. So that's cool because it actually runs quite quick, and it's just the same experience of a native app, but there's like basically a translation process. Um, it was mainly built when iOS was the only uh, game on the scene, so it has very, very good iOS support. Um, but you need to develop a multi-platform app in mind before you ever sit down to develop. So this is, you know, some of their marketing material. Look, we work on everything, including the desktop. Note that. But uh, as I mentioned, I did some work a couple weeks ago for a client where they had an iOS app and they wanted me to make it into an Android app. The iOS app was originally written in Titanium. And I was at a meeting with the vendor who wrote it. And he was not involved with the Android project. And as, I left the as, he le as the client left the room, he leans over to me and he's like, I wrote it in titanium. It won't be any problem. Just charge them a lot of money and like, export it. To, you know. So I go back to my computer and I'm like, well, this is great. If I can send my client an invoice for like thousands of dollars for doing an afternoon's work, that's br beautiful. So I said, export Android application. And of course, I get some strange, fatal error. It won't even build. And so I, I asked my business partner, Ross, I said, Ross, because we were on different time zones and he was just waking up and I was just going to bed. And I said, I have to get back to this client tomorrow on how we're going to do this. Can you take a look at this? And I wake up the next morning, I've got an email in my inbox and he said, okay, you can make it work, but you can't put a window inside of a window, which is what this guy did on the iOS app. So you need to take that out. And so all of a sudden, I wasn't writing once and deploying anywhere. You could do that. But I was writing for their platform. And then it will go out to the other platforms. But I have to think ahead of time. I have to know how to use their platform to write a cross-platform product. And to me, that was a really big red flag. Because basically what that means is, great, I'm not dependent on Android's SDK anymore. I'm not dependent on iOS's SDK. Now I'm dependent on them. And um, yeah, they charge money. About uh, $400 a year, $350 a year just to publish apps on their platform to Android and iOS. And you already have to pay Google and Apple to publish apps, so there's an expense. Another big problem I had with uh, Titanium was a Joel Spolsky coined concept called leaky abstractions. Um, I don't mean software memory leaks, although those are also a problem in these lower level platforms. But um, the example Joel Spolsky uses on his website is TCP IP. So TCP is built on top of IP with IP. Um, but TCP says you'll get the packet no matter what in the right order. And IP says you might get a packet. I'm going to send it. So how is it possible to guarantee transmission of a packet when your underlying technology doesn't support it? So the example he gives is um, TCP IP. You know, TCP is basically how HTTP works. So the web is built on TCP. But if your cat chews a whole, uh, choose through your Ethernet cable in the middle of a transaction. No, there's no guarantee that those packets are actually going to get there. So that's where the abstraction starts to leak. It works, and then there's some small side case where it doesn't. And in the case of TCP IP, it's a well-tested technology, and I think everyone's willing to accept that the abstraction doesn't always perfectly work. But then we build these things on top of it. We've built HTTP on top of it. We build things on top of that. We build things on top of that. So when you start having very, very high-level software that abstracts all these problems away, you can do a lot of things, but you also end up with problems uh, when things don't work out as planned. And that's kind of where I was going with these differences between the iOS and the Android platform. I can write one application that's going to compile down to both using Titanium, but the way that those operating systems have chosen to handle their user interface and user interaction, the way they've abstracted that, is different. And that platform, at the Titanium platform at this moment, doesn't handle that. So you have these kind of funny moments where it feels like it's an iOS app that just happens to be running on an Android. And that's where I was talking about uh, user experience. The user expects to be able to use that hardware back button on the phone if they're Android. Looking at uh, PhoneGap now, moving on from Titanium. PhoneGap is um, 
quite different. It does not compile down to native code. Basically, it relies that every single uh, mobile SDK has a web view component in it. And it basically just runs a mobile website inside of an app. However, it uses JavaScript hooks to hook into the native code. So you want to access, oh, that was backwards. So if you want to access um, the accelerometer, if you want to access geolocation, if you want to access any of the native APIs to the device, you just make a JavaScript call. PhoneGap magically makes that work, and then comes back to you in JavaScript with the answer. So actually, it's quite good for making a mobile app that has access to some of the features uh, on the phone. And it is very, has very good support across a wide number of devices. And the other thing uh, uh, is that PhoneGap doesn't have some of the problems Titanium has because, again, we're going back to that web paradigm. You let the web view handle the implementation of how everything's going to look. So you're not responsible for that. So you don't have to worry about some of those things because the browser, the browser software as part of the iOS or OS will, will actually handle that for you. Um, while, again, while I was making this presentation, things have been changing. Uh, Adobe has their own product called Air. They have a thing called Flash Packager. So you can, make, you can take all these old Flash assets and make them directly with ActionScript into an iOS app. Uh, I'm actually not going to talk too much about this platform today because I think that Adobe has figured the writing on the wall. Uh, I think they wrote this software because it had ActionScript and a lot of people know ActionScript and they said, oh, you can, you know, we have an offering. Um, but I, I don't see this software going anywhere. And why I say that is published October 5th, 2011. Adobe Systems has signed an agreement to acquire an Adobe software creator of PhoneGap and PhoneGap built. So I think uh, Adobe saw the writing on the wall, which is they can follow Titanium's business model, Accelerator's business model of, OK, we're just going to put a layer in between the developers and the native SDK. But I think that they see a time limit on that and that they want to be a little bit more open. And PhoneGap is open source and supports a wide number of uh, devices. But I don't want to equate those two platforms. Because if you're writing a more or less mobile app that needs access to device APIs, PhoneGap is the way to go, probably. But if you're writing something that requires almost like a really native experience, uh, then maybe Titanium is the way to go. Or if you ask me, I just write it in both. But Corona is uh, another one. This one is more for games. Uh, it's kind of interesting. They wrote a Lua interpreter. Uh, so Lua is kind of a, a simpler scripting language. It's an easy scripting language to, to figure out. And then what they do is they actually have you upload your project, and then they compile it down to native code on their server, and then they'll send you something for the App Store, whatever App Store you're compiling to. Uh, really, under the hood, it's just a Lua interpreter running against OpenGL, Box2D Physics Engine, just all of this off-the-shelf stuff that, that you can all access. So they've basically done you a favor of, well, here's a higher level language you can use to write games. Uh, and this is really the point I want to make here, is that the efficiency gains that you're going to get by all these platforms, I think it's inversely correlated with the amount of control you have over the user experience, the amount of things that you can do. So if you're writing a very simple app up front and you know it, you know, if your requirement is, I have to write a very simple app, it just has to do this, it needs to work on the most number of platforms, so on and so forth, maybe some of these cross-platform uh, cross frameworks can be the right choice. But you have to understand the trade-offs that you're accepting when you choose to use one. And one of them is that if they haven't written something into their SDK to access the native SDK that you want, then you just don't have it. So you lose a lot of control. And you should research what those controls are ahead of time, especially, or I'm sorry, what those limitations are ahead of time, especially if you're doing work for clients, because then they might come back and ask for a new feature. And if your platform doesn't support it, then you just have to tell them no, or rewrite it in a different platform. And the other thing is, really, when I read a lot of these websites and I read about these companies, it just feels like, does anybody know what it means to sell shovels in a gold rush? You don't dig for gold, you sell shovels. And that's what these companies are doing. They're saying, we've got all those, I'll save you the Ruby hipster picture again. They've got all these Ruby hipsters that are like, I want to use my JavaScript skills to build these awesome applications. And I've got this great idea, I'm sure you do. And they're like, oh, I can help you with that. Just give me $350 a year. Now, $350 a year, if you're running a company like me, maybe for an individual, maybe for hobbyists, that's a little bit steep. But if you're running a company, that's, that's an expense. That's something I can sign off on. Now, if it's $3,000, whoa. So honestly, I think these are just nothing more than snake oil salesmen in most cases. And I'm actually going to take a break out of the presentation here to just show you something interesting. I did a Google search while I was waiting for everyone to walk in on 
each company name, and then I put the word profitable, and I put company. And um, what's funny is that all the, the keywords say profitable for developers, great for developers. Accelerator is a VC-backed company, so they need to make a profit. So they're charging, yes, but are they making a profit? If I was running a profitable company, I guarantee you I'd want to tell everyone about it. I don't see anything on them saying that they're running a profit company. So when the VC money runs out, what are we going to do? Let's look at the Corona makers. Uh, okay, this guy's saying, I made an app and it was somewhat profitable. You know, and basically, if I keep going down, I can tell you the same thing. This company also took VC funding and has yet to announce publicly that they're profitable. Marmalade, same thing. Actually, the first thing that comes up with Marmalade is making Marmalade, so that's kind of cool. I guess they just changed their name recently. But I can go down to the management team here. And um, again, they talk about a guy who used to work at a company that was profitable, but they don't say anything about whether they're profitable or not. So I'm not saying that these frameworks are complete garbage, but I'm just saying when a company says, I want to charge you money for my platform, and their platform's brand new, and they haven't established their business model, you might want to consider whether you want to put your project's entire future with them or not. Now, you notice I left PhoneGap out of this because PhoneGap is open source. And while they were just purchased by Adobe, so the licensing could change moving forward. But if you get it now, uh, that licensing doesn't apply. So if they do decide to change it. But uh, moving on to HTML5, it's kind of a big part of this. It's a little bit higher level. But um, going back to, to the web, HTML4 couldn't do everything we wanted it to. And so we had a lot of, um, a lot of hacks like Flash to make things work. And the W3C committee, I think the, the verdict on the web now is that they went down the wrong path. They went from a technology perspective, not a user perspective. They're like, wouldn't it be great if HTML was all perfectly well-formed, like XML, and we could translation to, trans to this thing where machines could read everyone else's code, and like everything would be the semantic web, and so on and so forth. Well, unfortunately, uh, that may be great for a standards body, it may be great for an enterprise situation, but I think consumers are interested in like cool Flash games or websites that are interesting. They're not interested in whether that uh, HTML is well formed or not. And I think the cardinal sin of allowing browsers to render data that's not perfect was already committed in 1994. So going back in time and trying, or going forward in time and trying to fix it was kind of a mistake. Uh, and they finally admitted that. So W3C just uh, let the charter on uh, on that expire. So now. Um, as I said, Flash and, and so on filled the gaps in, in what HTML4 couldn't do. But now HTML5 is a standard 10 years in the making. Everyone knew this was a problem. And it tries to nail down all these proprietary bits, vector animation, audio and video. And it's an open standard. So as it becomes standardized, browser makers will ha would ostensibly implement it and therefore increase the portability of anything written using HTML5. And already, it's, it's kind of already there. Uh, if you, Firefox, WebKit, any of the WebKit browsers, they have very good HTML5 implementations so far. Some of the CSS3, th there's some still things that they're working on, but overall, even right now, it's already pretty good. IE9 does all right for Microsoft. Um, but one big thing that, that's a hot topic in HTML5 is to what extent the PhoneGap APIs are going to be just built directly into to, uh, HTML5. So in PhoneGap, you know, basically they give you a JavaScript API that talks to the native uh, API. Now, why is it that the browser just can't implement that functionality as well and provide some sort of some part of the, the document object model in JavaScript and just let uh, mobile apps access mobile web apps access that? And that's kind of the discussion now. And unfortunately, the implementation for that is kind of weak. So PhoneGap is still the one filling the gap. So here we are, though, because even if we do implement that on a couple of browsers, it's not there yet. We're going to be back to JavaScript tap. We're going to say, are you using a Chrome browser? Are you using a WebKit browser? Are you using this browser? Are you using that browser? Oh, we have to do this different. We have to do that different. We've, we've played this game before, uh, different, slightly different you know, brow competing standards, basically. So uh, HTML5 is promising, but the best it's ever going to do is build you a mobile web app. It's not going to build you a native experience. And that's, again, is that a trade-off you're willing to accept? I don't know where we're going. I'm just going to be open with that. In fact, my idea was to end a little bit early because I wanted to do Q&A instead because I wanted to talk about what you might be interested in. But I have absolutely no idea where all of this is going. 
Uh, I don't know if people, uh, users, you and I, are going to be happy with portable mobile web apps. I have this app. It works on any phone. Are they going to be happy with that? Or are they really going to require that native experience that Apple and now Android or Google have given us now? So I can't predict the future. I just had to put an XCD comic in here. It really doesn't relate. I just wanted to put it in there. But um, that slide is out of place. Oh, there we go. OK, so my questions are, will the standardized device APIs be good enough if that goes into HTML5? Will it be good? Will you feel, after having these native apps on your phone, Will you feel comfortable just navigating to some website? Uh, if anyone has an iPad and has looked at the Financial Times HTML5 app, that's a good start. Uh, it uses lots of cool stuff to make it work. But it's still not quite native, and, it's, and you can tell. And the other thing is, there's a lot of platforms at the moment, but much like the early days of HTML and the web, as the business models suss themselves out, as things move forward, maybe Maybe Microsoft, maybe BlackBerry will say, you know what, we're pulling the plug or we're changing our business model. Maybe Microsoft will pull out. So maybe the number of platforms might be small and limited, but it's not yet. Um, does anybody know who Joe Hewitt is, by the way? No? All right. What did he do? He did do 320. What else did he do? Do you know? He's, well, he's done a lot of stuff. He wrote Firebug originally. Yeah. He wrote Firebug and then he wrote uh, 320, which is a lot of the library components that are the Facebook iOS app. Uh, and he just posted on his blog the other day. I mean, this is stuff that people are talking about right now, and we don't have the answers. It's, you know, everyone, there's a lot of people saying, well, it has to be the web because the web is open and beautiful and great. And now me, from my user experience perspective, is saying, have you ever used a mobile web app versus a native app? The native apps are just so much better. And... But if I have a, a mobile app that doesn't work across multiple platforms, you know, maybe that's a problem for, for the business side of things, too. So I don't think we have an answer yet. But I, he is kind of negative in this blog, blog post. He's like, I end on a sad note is the last, last comment in the post is saying, you know, there's no solution. I want to be a little bit happier about it. I just want to say, this is a brand new thing, and I'm really excited about it. And you and I have not invented what the solution is yet. So it's not really, I didn't really write it into my abstract, but one of my goals of today's talk was to actually get you thinking about these problems because we need to solve them. There's a lot of problems. I've, I've just mentioned a lot of them today, and we don't know how we're going to solve them. So um, I hope that you can help me on that journey. So thank you very much. I guess that leaves us about 10 minutes or so for Q&A. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah. Well, um, a year ago they opened it up so that you could build apps in non-Objective C or C languages and compile them down. And as long as they ran on the architecture, they would let you upload them to the App Store. So a famous example of that is Monotouch, which allows you to write in .NET, and then it compiles down. So you can write iPhone apps in .NET if you want to. And previously, iPhone was fam or Apple was famous for not allowing that, and then they just reversed the decision. And that's also what opened Adobe making their Flash packager as well. So there's a lot of... Um, so I think they're opening up in that regard. But... Um, I still think that Apple is not going to give up their premium walled garden app store. We need to review everything, so on and so forth, because that, I think that, especially as the Android marketplace grows and eventually will definitely outsize them in just in terms of pure market share, I think that's their, their bread and butter. That's what they want to offer to the consumer and say, well, we have this. You know, we can. So I, I, I don't know. No. Getting it out. Yes. You can do a lot. Yeah. Oh, well, the, the app I wrote a couple weeks ago where I was taking an iOS app to an Android app, it actually got rejected the first time by Apple. 
I didn't make the content, they made the content, but it was, it was exactly that. It was like a mobile, this company's marketing department had gotten a hold of the idea of making an app and they just basically put all of their marketing content from the website into the app. And it was, it was awful, but they pay well. And then they said, they said, okay, you know, oh, it got rejected because it's all marketing content. That's one of Apple's uh, review guidelines. So we consulted with them and we said, you just need to make it do something. So what we found out was we put an RSS reader in there. So it, it reads an RSS feed, processes it into a table, and then you can tap on it and read an article. Now that's not groundbreaking, but it is a feature. And it's something that's not available on their website and so on and so forth. So that was enough. And then they were like, okay, we'll let it through. And it still has a lot of that marketing garbage in there. So I think from Apple's perspective, it's not whether it's a thinly veiled, veiled web view, because there are many phone gap applications on the App Store. It's a matter of, uh, using those technologies, does your app do something interesting? Uh, and, but you do have a good point. If you don't want to, if you've done all of that work, and if HTML5 comes along and WebKit starts using some of those device native APIs in, if that works in WebKit, then there'd be no reason even to, to have it as an app. You could just have it as a website. Yes? Oh, yeah? I did not know that, actually. Thank you for that information, because that's quite good. Um, I do think that there's some, that, that's why I, I guess what I was saying, I was asking a question of, you know, are this many frameworks going to exist for this long? Probably not, because I think the companies, they want to encourage developers. Um, Blackberry, when they came out with their playbook, uh, like iPad-y thing, they made a, uh, they made a, uh, it runs Android apps, basically, because they were like, okay, well, we need the applications. So I think it's actually the developers that have more choice. The platforms that the developers write for are going to be the ones that, that get attention. And my specific comment on hearing that about Microsoft is that Microsoft, by doing that, they can create lots of mobile apps just based on the fact that people are going to write desktop mobile. Because Windows desktop is still has quite a market share. So the, those two being the same makes a lot of sense to me. And Google betting things on Chrome OS also makes sense to me. But I think both of those things are business-driven decisions. I don't think either of those companies wants to do that because it's easier for us developers. So. Yes. Oh, right behind you. Sorry. He, he, was, he was like half a second faster. It's frustrating. And that's why I probably sounded like, and if I didn't sound like, I should have sounded like, I support writing in native SDKs because there, there's only one layer between you and the actual hardware and the user. It's only you and whatever company is making that SDK. When you start adding these other layers, you start adding these dependencies. And if it's your, as I said, if you're a hobbyist and it's your own project and you don't really care and you just kind of want to see what the technology can do, I think that's great. But if you're trying to provide a solution to a user, it's risky. Yes. Along those same lines, I'd like to modify your okay. profitability isn't necessarily the issue. Yeah. So that eventually it'll become profitable. Right, yes. Because following your philosophy, Red Hat wouldn't have been <laughs> existence. Okay. You're right. I'm being I was being unnecessarily unfair to them. Because uh, a business that my business was not profitable in its first year and a half. So. Now, a following question is: What would be the first platform? iOS. Why? Uh, market share. No. Android is coming up, but average revenue per user is what I'm looking at. So I'm not looking at total number of users. I'm looking at average re revenue per user. Uh, so now that number is also changing. So Android users are spending more now than they did last year. So, uh, and the reason, I, I mean, we can all speculate on the reason why, but I think the main reason why is probably anyone that was running out to get a smartphone went and got an, an iPhone. And then now that some of the Android devices have gotten bigger and better and, and basically, you know, better than the iPhone in a number of cases, people that are actually really interested in that and who are on the device all the time are actually adopting the device. Uh, I'd love to hear it. Ooh, it's grown, but I don't know how much. Hmm. 
relationships with Dell. I don't know. Oh, that's yes. I'm curious when somebody, if it becomes a duopoly between Google and Apple, I'm very worried because 30% is very expensive. Uh, I have to charge end users more, a lot more money just to make enough to live. Uh, and they provide me a payment solution, but uh, just a, a contrast. Um, one of the interesting things about the Japan mobile business is that Japan had a very uh, expanded, developed mobile marketplace in about 2002. Um, and basically, they did carrier billing for everything, and the carrier took 9%. And that encouraged this whole flourishing ecosystem that basically made Japan's mobile well ahead of everyone else. Unfortunately, they didn't, they didn't make the smartphone technology. But, so I think that's it, too, is the more money you can make on a platform, you're going to go to it. And I hope, I hope that leads to a race to the bottom. You know. Yes? Uh, the Android fragmentation problem? Okay. On iOS, you have less of a fragmentation, just because, I mean, there's only a limited number of devices. So, um, and, but um, while I was doing research for this presentation, I was reading about Angry Birds, because I was trying to, I was reading about Rovio, because I was trying to find an app developer company that I could make the argument that they had more or less infinite resources. So I wanted to say, and of course, a company with more or less infinite resources has a native app for every single platform. But even in making their uh, Android application, they just picked the top 30 models that they, you know, it's a trade-off. What can we support? And, and I think whatever metric you choose, whether it's um, market share of that model or what, how the experience of the app is on that device, whether it's fast enough or not. So Apple has officially retired 3G support. Our apps still run on iPhone 3Gs, albeit very poorly. But that's the decision we made. So I, I think at that point it stops being in the technical domain and starts being in the business domain. But I do see fragmentation in Android as less of a problem because now that I've learned Android this year, I used to just do iOS, the way the uh, view layouts work is actually a lot more uh, friendly to different screen sizes and such. So I think processing capability and memory becomes the main um, problem. But again, uh, API, I think you're talking more about API version, is that right? Like 2.1 or? I don't want to. Okay. When you say 2.1, now correct me, because again, I, I'm, you know, I'm new to Android. Uh, I believe from that one is the one you can't upgrade or something like that. Aren't there some that like it stops at a certain point or can the user just? Oh, okay, yeah. So that user could go out and buy that 2.1 phone and then immediately upgrade it to three? Yes, okay. Speaking, speaking as a developer, all of these things really annoy me. But speaking as a technologist, I actually think this is very good. Because with Google allowing the uh, device makers to customize the, the Android operating system, that's probably why they're not letting you go up on that or something. Like that, because they've written some custom code that's relying on it and they don't want to. But that's what's going to drive, I think, innovation is some device makers will want to do something really, really interesting. And they'll need to write some custom Android code to make it work. And that's going to cause some incompatibilities. But then once, something, once, they, once somebody finds something really interesting, then it's going to catch on and you'll see it. Uh, just with Android in general, the notification bar that you pull down at the top, that's way better than iOS is like popping up with something. And so, of course, iOS 5, there it is. So I, we will see that in the next two or three years, I think, is everyone's going to copy each other's ideas. And the best ideas, hopefully, will drive market share, which will drive people to adopt those.
I had one of those. I had one of those. I had one of those in my old company. I gave it back. <laughs> Seriously. Um, any other questions? Yes. Uh, ooh. I don't think it matters too much. Because I think that the, when I, the user experience I'm talking about, I'm probably even more picky than most people. And I think Apple, as I said, I have a client who has a really bad app, but the Apple let it through because it did something. So they're not going to be so draconian as to say, your app has to be beautiful and amazing. So they'll, they'll let kind of anything that doesn't crash and basically passes their, that ticks the boxes, they'll let through. And user experience is so subjective that I don't think they can reject or permit on that basis. So in as much as, I mean, in as much as having an app that doesn't crash is good user experience, yes, in that sense, yes, it does. Um, so I guess, so yeah, I guess the answer to your question is yes, because you can write, you can have Android public apps on the marketplace that crash all the time. So yeah, I guess, it, but, but the, when I talk about user experience, I want to be talking about a level like way above that. Like I think crashing is like, really? Like we're at that level, and that's that's why I talk about testing and, and things like that. Yes. Yeah. You do see native apps for Mac and Windows, right? They're written. On those platforms, kind of directly, right? Is that not what you meant? Well, I just mean like there isn't a Facebook app, right? But there is an iOS app, and no one would ever go to Facebook. Ah, oh, I see. I mean, is there a distinction that we have to make these native apps? I think, as I was saying, with HTML5, a lot of the capabilities, and with a lot of a lot of the capabilities, will come. The question is whether or not the user experience will be good enough that the user who's already had a native experience that was very smooth and they liked, whether they're willing to accept. Uh, an app. So the Financial Times put their their reader on the iPad on as an HTML5 app, not through the App Store, because they didn't want to pay Apple's 30%. Was that decision driven by the user? No, it was driven by their finance department. So I don't disagree with them, because that's their business model. And as the end consumer, I guess I can agree if we get to a point where customers are so, users are so comfortable paying for things, and one of these things is 30% cheaper because I get it through the, the mobile web as opposed to a native app, then yeah, I, I do think that that might drive some adoption. But to the end user, as long as the prices are the same or as long as the prices are free, uh, you know, which one are you going to take, right? So I, I don't think it's, as I said, I, it, to me, when I s sat down to start thinking about this, I was like, man, this really feels like we're going backwards. You know, um, but that's the way of it, right? And and the other thing is, I mean, uh, as I said, you know, this just the the capabilities of this device um, are are quite limited. So I think being the native is somewhat uh, required by the fact that the APIs are much lower level. So that's about it. So maybe I'll take one more question if there is one. Otherwise, we're good. Cool. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming, guys.